Hello. This talk is about asymptotic approximations, and I hope to be able to describe what an asymptotic approximation is, and secondly, how it can be used, and one or two simple applications to real problems. The problems I'm chosen are going to be very simple ones, just to illustrate the method, but I do want to make the point that the method has got very wide applicability and can be used to solve many problems which can't really be done by any other method. Firstly, just let me say a few words about different types of approximation. There's a well-known approximation for the number pi, which is defined to be the ratio of the perimeter of a circle to its diameter. The approximation you see in school textbooks is that pi is given by 22 over 7. And this can be best described as a rough approximation because it is not exact. In fact, it's out by an error of approximately 0.04 of a percent. It's also got the disadvantage that there's no simple and obvious way to improve upon that rough estimate. Let's then look at something a little bit better, and that's the well-known decimal point representation for the number pi. And here it is. I've written out the first few figures. Well, what does this mean in detail? You see there's a few dots at the end there which uh, require a little bit of explanation. What this sort of series means is that if you stop here at 3.1, it's really telling you that the number pi is somewhere between 3.1 and 3.2. That is to say the error is less than a tenth. If, on the other hand, we look at the first two decimal places and take 3.14 and stop there, this is really saying that the number pi is somewhere between 3.14 and 3.15. That is to say the error is less than a hundredth, and so on. The disadvantage of this particular representation is it's not clear from this picture where it's come from. In fact, I used here the well-known method of copying it from a book. It is not at all clear where that number came from, and it is indeed very difficult to get an accurate representation for pi. So let's then move on to the next approximation, a series approximation, this line here. And this is a series representation for the number pi. To be more precise, it's the series representation for the number quarter pi. Now this is a bit more like it. Once again we can think of this as an approximation in a sense because if you were going to use this on your calculator to estimate the value of pi you would have to stop somewhere. So if you stopped at the second term that would give you one approximation for pi. If you then took the next term that would give you an improved approximation and so on. And the more terms you take the closer you get to the value of pi by 4. So in a sense this can be regarded as an exact expression for pi by 4 in the sense that if you take more and more terms you will get closer and closer to the correct value. This is called a convergent series. A generalization of that is the corresponding series for tan to the minus 1 of epsilon. That is the angle whose tangent is epsilon. And here in the rest of this talk, I'm going to use epsilon to denote a small number. Usually, epsilon will be regarded as a small positive number, but sometimes it can be either positive or negative. Let's then look at this expression for tan to the minus 1 of epsilon. Again, uh, it is a series which continues indefinitely. It can be shown that if epsilon is less than 1, this series does converge to the correct value tan to the minus 1 of epsilon. We can look upon it in another way, though. If we stop after the first term and get the approximation tan to the minus 1 epsilon equals epsilon, there is, of course, an error. And that error is small if the number epsilon is taken to be small. That is to say, instead of tan to the minus 1 being equal to epsilon, tan to the minus 1 epsilon equals epsilon, but with a small error, which I've denoted here by R1. And if this is to be the correct leading term, then there is an implication that R1 has to be small in some sense. And to be precise, R1 has got to be a lot less than epsilon when epsilon gets small. We can put it this way. R1 over epsilon tends to zero as epsilon gets smaller. We could get a more accurate approximation by taking more terms. If, for example, we take the first two terms in that series, then we have tan to the minus 1 epsilon equals epsilon minus the third epsilon cubed. And the fact that we've taken two terms 
means that we've improved the approximation provided epsilon is sufficiently small. That is to say, tan to the minus 1 epsilon equals the sum of these first two terms with an error which I've denoted by R3. And if this is to be correct, R3 has got to be negligible compared to epsilon cubed. In other words, R3 is a very small error. To be precise, R3 divided by epsilon cubed has got to tend to 0 when epsilon is sufficiently small. We can go on. If we include more and more terms, tan to the minus 1 epsilon is given by this expression, and this series continues, epsilon 7th divided by 7 is the next term, and so on. And this is called an asymptotic expansion. Let me just pause here to remind you of the difference between a convergent series and an asymptotic expansion. These are two quite different concepts. This particular example of tan to the minus 1 epsilon is a good one because it's both a convergent series and an asymptotic series. Let me explain the difference. With a convergent series, one can get better and better accuracy by taking more and more terms. Think of this formula with a fixed value of epsilon say a tenth or a hundredth. And we get more and more accuracy by taking more and more terms. So we take the first term, the second term, the third term, more and more terms, till by the time we get off the picture here, the series has given a very accurate representation for the function tan to the minus 1 of epsilon. In other words, a convergent series gives you accuracy by taking more and more terms with a fixed value of the parameter epsilon. An asymptotic expansion gets accuracy in a quite different way. For an asymptotic expansion, you think of a fixed number of terms. Perhaps we might stop after the first two terms. So forget this one. An asymptotic series is obtained by taking a fixed number of terms, say two, and getting more and more accuracy by letting the parameter epsilon tend to zero. Let me summarize that then. For a convergent series, you take a fixed value of epsilon and take more and more terms. For an asymptotic series, you take a fixed number of terms and let epsilon tends to zero. The particular example I've given here is both a convergent and an asymptotic series. But it's quite possible for an asymptotic expansion not to converge at all. I'll give an example of that. Consider this integral which is a function of the small parameter epsilon. And here I'm thinking of epsilon as being small. Perhaps epsilon might be a tenth or a hundredth or a thousandth. The key feature here is that this exponential term, e to the minus t over epsilon, is very small indeed once t reaches a significant number. For example, if t is about four times epsilon, then this term here is about 0.02. And the smaller epsilon gets, the more rapidly does this term decay. That suggests very strongly that the main contribution to this integral is going to come from the region quite close to t equals 0. The integration goes from 0 to infinity. But we suspect that the main contribution is going to come from small positive values of t. That being the case, we can replace this expression, 1 over 1 plus t, by its well-known geometric progression. There's quite a lot implied in this step because the function 1 over t is given by this series only if t is less than 1. The series does not converge for t bigger than 1. And yet we've replaced this by this throughout the whole range of integration. And you'll notice I have been careful to put a asymptotic symbol there, not equals. Let's suppose for the moment that we can make the step from here to here. Then we can integrate term by term and we finish up with the representation that i equals epsilon which comes from this term and then there's an epsilon squared term which comes from integrating this term and then an epsilon cubed term which comes from integrating this term and so on. We suspect that this is the asymptotic representation for the original integral i. It is not at all difficult to see that this some diverges. Because if we t take epsilon to be fixed and let the number of terms get bigger, we have a 1 factorial, a 2 factorial, a 3 factorial, the next term will be 4 factorial, 5 factorial, 
by the time we get over to the side of the right hand side of the page the n factorial will be a really massive number and successive terms just increase beyond bound so that is certainly not an convergent series if you attempt to get accuracy by taking more and more terms you will find that the terms just get bigger and bigger and bigger and what comes out is basically rubbish however I do assert that this gives an asymptotic expression let me just indicate why that is so for this the first term if I take the first term of this series which is you will recall obtained by approximating 1 plus t to the minus 1 by 1 let's have a look at the error involved in that well 1 over 1 plus t differs from 1 by t over 1 plus t in other words the error is given exactly by this expression the minus sign indicates that the error is negative now it's quite easy to get a bound for this because t over 1 plus t is certainly less than t that's obvious because t is bigger than naught and therefore 1 over 1 plus t is less than 1 so that the error is certainly less than this integral here which can be evaluated and is epsilon squared in other words i is given by epsilon together with an error r1 whose magnitude is less than epsilon squared and so on we could stop after any term and deduce that the error after stopping after the fourth term for example is certainly negligible compared to epsilon to the fourth and this sort of argument establishes that this expression is indeed an asymptotic representation for the integral i so much for background now let me take a specific example and I've chosen a very straightforward example nothing more complicated than solving a cubic equation the point of this of course is to have a simple problem for which we know the answer by other means and see how asymptotic methods might enable us to find a solution in a fairly simple way here's the problem then is just a cubic expression x cubed minus 2x squared plus epsilon x where epsilon is a small number to be definite let's think of epsilon as being a small positive number well if epsilon is small one's first thought is to simply neglect this term for example if epsilon is a thousandth or a millionth surely we can throw this term away compared to the other two that is to say as our first approximation we replace the actual expression for y by the simplified expression in which the epsilon x term is absent the point of this the advantage of this is that the roots of this equation are extremely simple the three roots of that equation are given by x equals 2 x equals naught and the second root at x equals naught so as a rough approximation the three roots are given by 2 naught and naught let's see how we can get an improved estimate for the root near x equals 2 there are the graphs of y and its approximating function y naught for the particular case when epsilon is a tenth 0.1 you see that y naught passes through x equals 2 and the function y passes fairly close to that but is slightly less than 2 let's see how we can improve on the estimate x equals 2 for one of the roots of that equation well we'll simply boldly try an expansion of the following form we'll write x equals 2 plus a small correction proportional to epsilon plus a small correction proportional to epsilon squared so when epsilon is small the correction terms are negligible compared to 2 the plan now is to substitute this assumed form into the cubic equation and to find out what value a and b must take I'm going to show in detail how we find the value of a you'll recall that y is x cubed minus 2x squared plus epsilon x if we then take this value of x and cube it the first couple of terms are given by these two that is x cubed and I'm not including the epsilon squared terms similarly minus 2x squared is given by these two terms and then the final term which is epsilon x is given by this and the dots here mean that I'm throwing away terms of order epsilon squared and smaller well the constant terms balance 8 and minus 8 go out 
and the epsilon terms vanish provided I choose a particular value for a. a in fact has to be minus a half. So the improved value for the root near x equals 2 is given by this thing in the box. x is equal to 2 minus a half epsilon. That deals with the root near x equals 2. There are two other roots near the origin. In fact, one root is at the origin. It's quite clear from the original expression that if you substitute x equals 0, y is 0. But what about the other root near x equals 0? We want to look at the cubic equation in some detail near x equals 0 to try to find out where that root is that lies quite close to x equals 0 but not quite at x equals 0. And it's a matter of looking at the function in the right amount of detail. The next picture shows how important it is to get the right sort of magnification in a problem. This picture represents 25 of the pictures that, take, uh, that uh, form this lecture. And I think most people would agree that there is too much detail on this picture to be able to see anything really useful. In other words, if we want to get some useful information from this picture, we have to magnify it. So let's look round about this region here and magnify by a factor of about 100 or so. Let's see what we get. Not much better. In fact, that probably contains even less useful information. Those observant members of the audience will notice that this is the letter E and this is the letter M from the word problem that appeared on a previous picture. But clearly we've overdone it here. The magnification is too much and a very important aspect of solving problems of this type is to get the magnification just right. It's a crucial feature of asymptotic analysis. Get the right magnification. Let's see what we can do with our cubic problem then. What I want to do is to magnify the picture in such a way that I can get some useful information of the behaviour of the cubic near the origin, near x equals naught. By how much should I magnify the picture in the x direction and the y direction? Look at the cubic we're trying to deal with. That is the exact expression. Throwing away this term was good except for values of x near the origin. But when x is near the origin, these two terms are also small. Therefore, it was wrong to throw away the epsilon x term, no matter how small epsilon might be. In other words, near the origin, I really want to retain this term because it must be comparable in magnitude to one or other of these two. But when x is small, x squared is very small and x cubed is very small indeed. In other words, this term, the cubic term, is negligible compared to the quadratic when x is very small. That suggests that near the origin, near x equals naught, the correct balance of terms is in fact between these two. And that suggests that the balance occurs when epsilon x and x squared are around about the same size. In other words, x is of order epsilon. So if epsilon is a hundredth, we magnify in the x direction by a factor of about a hundred. If epsilon is a millionth, we magnify in the x direction by a factor of about a million. Note also we can say something about y. If x is of order epsilon squared, then both these terms are of order epsilon squared. In other words, y is of order epsilon squared. So y as magnitude epsilon squared. This strongly suggests then the following scaling to get a better representation of the cubic near the origin. We rescale by writing x equals epsilon times capital X and y is epsilon squared times capital Y. Now let's have a look at the picture with this particular scaling. On the left is the graph of the original cubic and you will see a very small rectangle near the origin which is of length 2 epsilon and of height 2 epsilon squared. The rectangle goes between x equals minus epsilon and x equals plus epsilon and in the y direction, that rectangle goes between y equals minus epsilon squared and y equals plus epsilon squared. So in terms of our new variables, capital Y and capital X, the picture looks like this. Let me just remind you of what this is. Think of that little rectangle there, 
Magnify it by a factor of 1 over epsilon in the x direction and by a factor of 1 over epsilon squared in the y direction, and that's what you see. And that's quite satisfactory. We see there sufficient detail of the cubic to be able to see where the roots are given approximately. It's saying this. If epsilon was equal to, let's say, 1,000th, the best way to look at the picture near the origin is to expand by a factor of 1,000 in the x direction and expand by a factor of 1,000 squared, that is to say a million, in the y direction. And then the picture looks like this one on the right, which gives us a much better view. This shows the cubic expressed in terms of capital Y and capital X. And you will notice in this manifestation, it is the epsilon x cubed term that is small. It's the cubic term that's small. And the solid line there shows the cubic capital Y. Now if we wish to approximate this for epsilon small, we simply throw away this term to get y naught x minus 2x squared. And the smaller epsilon gets, if we write the graph in terms of capital Y and capital X, the picture for successively smaller values of epsilon collapses onto this dotted line. The one I've shown there is for epsilon is 0.1. If I took epsilon to be 0.01 or 0.001, the dotted line and the solid line would get closer and closer together. That is to say, with this particular rescaling, the graph collapses onto the dotted line shown here. That being the case, we can get a very good representation for the root near the origin. In this magnified picture, we'll see that the root, which appeared to be near the origin, has one somewhere near x equals a half and the other one at x equals zero. Recall that when x equals a half, in terms of the original variable little x, this is equal to a half epsilon. On this magnified picture, the root appears at x equals a half. And we can follow the previous method in improving upon that. Let's try to get an improved approximation by trying an expansion for uh, capital X and seeing where it leads us. We know one of the roots is near x equals 0 and the other root is near x equals a half. Well, can we improve on that? Certainly. Let's write x equals a half plus a correction, a epsilon plus b epsilon squared. The next move is to substitute that expression into the formula, into the cubic, this expression, and see what happens. x is x, so if I just take the first two terms, I have a half and an a times epsilon. The dots there mean I'm excluding smaller order terms in epsilon. I'm excluding the epsilon squared terms. Now let's have a look at x squared. We simply square this expression, retain only the terms proportional to epsilon, and this is what we get for x squared. And finally, the cubic term, if x is equal to this expression, x cubed is roughly speaking an eighth plus higher order terms, and so we get left with this expression. The constant terms cancel out, and the epsilon terms will cancel out provided I choose a suitably. And the appropriate value for a is one eighth. That will ensure that this, this, and this term all cancel out. In other words then, my improved root near x equals a half is a half plus a bit, a half plus an eighth times epsilon. Now we can summarize where we've got to. The root near little x equals a half epsilon is given by a half epsilon plus an eighth epsilon squared. That really comes from this expression, bearing in mind that little x is epsilon times big X. One root is at the origin. The other root, the one we found first, is at 2 minus a half epsilon. This is giving us the approximate lo location of the roots of this cubic, and these approximations should get better and better as epsilon tends to zero. Well, we can test it out in this special case because the problem is so straightforward that we could have found numerically, we could have found numerical values for the roots. And the table I'm going to show you now indicates how accurate our asymptotic approximation is. I'm going to show you an approximation obtained by just taking the leading order terms, x equals a half epsilon and x equals 2. 
I call that the zeroth approximation. And then I'm going to show you the approximate value we get if we include the first two terms, this one and this one, and we'll compare those with the exact values obtained by numerical computation. Let's look at the results. If epsilon is equal to 0.1, tenth, the rough approximation, the zeroth approximation, gives us these two values. You'll recall x equals 2 is one approximation, one root, and x equals a half epsilon is the approximate location of the second root. I can improve those by taking the next term in the asymptotic series, and if I take the next term in the asymptotic series for the root near 2, I get 2 minus a half epsilon, which gives me this value. As for the root near x equals a half epsilon, you'll recall that the correction there is a half epsilon plus an eighth epsilon squared. So including both those terms, I get this as my estimate for the root near a half epsilon. The exact values are given by these expressions on the right, and you'll see that the uh, agreement is not too bad. They correct up to the first couple of decimal places, but fail at higher order decimal places. Two here uh, is instead of the exact value three. I did promise you that if epsilon gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the accuracy obtained from an asymptotic expression gets better and better and better. In other words, if I take epsilon to be a hundredth rather than the tenth, surely the approximation should be better. And indeed, that is the case. If I just take the rough approximation, that's two as before, and the half epsilon. The first approximation is given by x equals two, or x equals a half epsilon. That's these two expressions. I improve these a bit by including the next approximation. So this one represents two minus a half epsilon. This one represents x equals a half epsilon plus an eighth epsilon squared. And I'm retaining four uh, significant figures. And you'll see that this compares very favorably with the exact expressions given over here. In fact, if epsilon is 0.01, the first two terms in the asymptotic series is identical with the exact expression up to the order of accuracy I've taken for significant figures. Now that is a very simple example showing how to solve a cubic. You could be forgiven for not being overly impressed with this because Anybody can solve a cubic. There is, in fact, a formula for solving the roots of a cubic. That isn't the point. The point is that this sort of method, which I've illustrated by a cubic, can be applied to much more difficult problems. And in the next part of the talk, I shall have a look at the consequences of applying asymptotic techniques to differential equations. Hello. In the first part of this talk, I used asymptotic methods to solve a rather simple problem of finding the roots of a cubic equation. And I did promise that the same sort of ideas can be used to solve rather more demanding problems. I'm now going to give a couple of examples on asymptotic methods used to solve differential equations. Once again, quite deliberately, I've chosen examples for which there is a known exact solution so that we can compare the approximate solution with the exact solution and convince ourselves that we are getting the right answer. Take my word for it. This method can be used for many problems for which you can't find an exact answer. In real life, you don't find the answer in the back of the book. You have to find it for yourself. And it's a very good idea to have a powerful method that can be used to solve problems which can't be done by other means. Let's get on with it then and look at a simple differential equation dy by dx minus epsilon y is equal to x for x between 0 and 1. I'll remind you that epsilon here is supposed to be a small positive quantity. Think of it as being a thousandth or something. Now this first order differential equation is rendered unique by imposing a starting condition or a boundary condition, so I'm going to insist that y equals 1 when x equals 0. The exact solution for this is, of course, easy to find, and I've written it down in square brackets here. There's the exact solution for any epsilon, small or large. And in particular, if we take epsilon to be small, it's got this approximate form. Suppose, though, we didn't know the answer. Suppose the answer were not in the back of the book. 
and we're asked to find more directly the approximate solution when epsilon is small. Well, cast your eye on the equation again. Here it is. And if epsilon is small, surely we can throw this term away. If epsilon tends to zero, if it's a millionth or a ten millionth or something, surely that term is negligible. Well, let's suppress that term, and I'll write y naught to denote the approximation obtained by suppressing the epsilon term. So the equation reads this. Trivially, the solution is y naught equals a half, x, a half x squared plus a constant. And to get the right starting condition, the constant has to be 1. So there's our first approximation. We can, of course, improve this by trying an uh, asymptotic approximation where we have an order 1 term, an order epsilon term, an order epsilon squared term, and so on. So let's see how that would go through. To get an improved approximation, let's just suppose for the moment that the approximation takes the form y0 plus epsilon times y1, and so on. Substitution into the original differential equation gives us this. The dots here mean that I'm suppressing terms of order epsilon squared and epsilon cubed and so on. If you look at the terms of order 1, that is just this term and this term which don't carry an epsilon, here's the problem for y0. It's the one we've already looked at. And the solution is, of course, y0 is 1 plus a half x squared. But we're now looking for an improvement upon that simple solution. So we'll now examine the epsilon, the epsilon terms in the differential equation, namely a balance between this term and this one. In other words, dy1 by dx equals y0. But we know y0, so that's equal to 1 plus x squared. And this has got the starting condition that y1 equals 0 at x equals 0. Well, again, a simple integration uh, determines y1 apart from an arbitrary constant. So y1 is equal to x, the integral of this, plus x cubed over 6, that is the integral of this, plus a constant. And the constant has to be 0 in order to satisfy the starting condition at x equals 0. In other words, then, the asymptotic solution, which we've now found to order epsilon, is given by this term, y0, plus epsilon times y1. And that is indeed the expression that we got from the exact solution in the limit epsilon small. That one was an extremely straightforward example, and in principle we could use it to find higher order terms proportional to epsilon squared, epsilon cubed, and so on. Almost no real problems are this simple. One always comes across a difficulty that the approximation you obtain isn't valid for all values of the variable x. And so one has to use a much more a subtle idea, uh, which is called matched asymptotic expansions. And this is what I want to touch upon next. In many real problems, one simple approximation for the function y does not suffice to give you a good approximation of the whole range of values. So one seeks to find two or more approximations in overlapping regions which together give you a solution everywhere. I've written it down here. We need two or possibly more approximations which are valid in different regions but of course are required to smoothly join together in the region of overlap. There's a beautiful picture by the artist Escher which shows in a sense um, what matched asymptotic approximations are about and I will show you that picture. A well-known picture, Sky and Water by Escher. Down at the bottom, the picture is obviously one of fish. The top of the picture can be clearly identified as birds. And as you move up the picture from bottom to top, the fish smoothly change over imperceptibly from one approximation, which is a fish at the bottom, to another approximation at the top. And that really contains the spirit of matched asymptotic expansions. You have one approximation in one region, the fish in Escher's picture. In another region, you have a totally different type of approximation, birds, and the two things imperceptibly match together. Let me look at a specific problem to see what I mean. Here's a differential equation of second order. That is to say there is a second derivative here. 
There's a small parameter times d2y by dx squared, and then there's a first derivative, and then there's 2y. And that is required to be 0 in the range of interest, let's say x between 0 and 1. And epsilon here is a strictly positive but small real number. Because this is a second order equation, we require two uh, conditions, and the conditions I've chosen are that y equals 0 at x equals 0, and y equals 1 at x equals 1. Once again, this problem is so simple that there is an exact solution available, and I've written it down. There's the exact solution. However, suppose we don't know the exact solution. What I want to try to do now is to obtain a good approximation to the function y using asymptotic methods. It's always a good start to do the obvious in a problem. So let's look at the equation and see what happens. And we'll see that there is an obvious thing to do, and we'll also quickly see that it leads us into a difficulty. Here's the equation. And I want to point out that this term carries a very small coefficient. So if epsilon is a millionth, this term will presumably be very small compared to those two. So the obvious thing to do is to delete that term. Let's look at the next picture. There's the equation again. As a first shot, a first try, I'm going to neglect this term. And I'll denote the approximation so obtained by y naught, as a reminder that we're solving a simplified equation, this one, instead of the original one, which is that. You see we have a problem here, because the approximate equation is a first order equation, and therefore we can only satisfy one of the subsidiary conditions. You'll recall that y is supposed to be 0 at x equals 0, and y is supposed to be 1 at x equals 1. However, we've only one arbitrary constant. If you solve this equation, that is its most general solution. And we can choose a so that y equals 1 at x equals 1, and this is our first approximation. The trouble is, it fails near x equals 0. What's gone wrong? The only assumption we've made is that this term is negligible. So for some reason, which is not yet completely clear, that term is not negligible near the origin. First of all, let me just examine the solution we've obtained compared to the exact solution for various values of the epsilon. We have an approximation y equals y naught, which is e times e to the minus x. And I'm claiming that this is, at least for some values of x, a good approximation to the exact solution. We'll see by looking at the picture that it is good and bad. The approximation, the, here the full line denotes the exact solution, y, which I've obtained by a, a numerical uh, process, and the dotted line shows our approximation, y naught. The two lines are quite good, have quite good agreement in this region, but very poor in this region. Perhaps epsilon isn't small enough. This was for the specific case of epsilon equals 0.2. Let's try epsilon equals 0.1, make epsilon smaller, see if we can get a better approximation. Well, this is a bit better. The agreement is very good in this region, but there is now a smaller region than before where the solution is not good. Now begin to panic, so let's take epsilon to be smaller still, 0.05, and see if we can make a better job of it. Well, once again you see there is an improvement, but there's still a region near the origin where the, the approximation is bad. Now if I were an advertising man, trying to sell soap flakes or something, I might be tempted to cheat a little bit and just show you part of the graph. If I showed you that part of the graph and showed how splendid my approximation was, you would be impressed. However, if I show you the full picture, you're moderately impressed, but you'll notice that the agreement is very poor down in this region. Furthermore, no matter how small you make epsilon, you can never make the thing right near x equals 0, because our approximating function y0 has the value e at x equals 0, 2.718, whereas we're told to make the value of y equal to 0 at x equals 0. So no matter how small you make epsilon, the, fun the graph is going to fail near this critical region near x equals 0. That means to say we've made a mistake in throwing away the epsilon term in this region. What we now have to do is look rather more closely at this region by rescaling. 
by magnifying the graph in the vicinity of x equals 0. I'm now going to rescale in a similar sort of way to the procedure we used in the cubic problem by stretching the graph in the x direction. And the rescaling I'm going to use is as follows. I'm going to write x equals epsilon times big X, and I'll leave y as big Y. What it comes to is this. If epsilon is a hundredth, I'm going to stretch in the x direction by a factor of a hundred. If epsilon is a millionth, I'm going to stretch by a factor of a million. In terms of these variables, the equation has a different look about it. That is, in fact, exactly the same equation as the one we started with, except it's rewritten in terms of the variables capital Y and capital X. And what we see now is that in this region, that is a negligible term, and these two balance. So in this inner region, quite close to the origin, it looks as though this is the negligible term, and this one is important. Let's try to firm that up a little bit by uh, suppressing the epsilon term in that equation and seeing what approximation we get for the function capital Y. Here we are then. There's the exact equation. I'm now going to suppress that term and denote the appropriate, the corresponding function Y by Y naught. The naught there is a reminder that we're approximating by throwing this term away. So the problem for y naught is the one inside this box. It's a second order equation with the y term missing. And for this function I can satisfy the boundary condition at x equals naught. And when little x equals naught, big x equals naught also. This equation is so simple that we can write down its solution. a and b are any constants at this stage. But I must insist that y0 is 0 at x equals 0. So if you substitute x equals 0 in here, that just comes to a plus b, and therefore b must be minus a. So our first approximation in the inner region, close to the origin, is that y0 is a constant a times 1 minus e to the minus 2x. How do we determine a? We can't use the boundary condition at x equals 0 again. We've already used that. We cannot directly use the boundary condition at x equals 1 because our approximation capital Y holds only near the origin. What then have we got left to determine the constant A? Well, I remind you where we've got so far. We have an approximation little y naught which holds almost everywhere but is very poor near the origin. Near the origin we have a different sort of approximation given by my function capital Y naught this expression, and I do of course require these functions to join on. The original function y um, was a smooth function and therefore my two approximations must overlap smoothly. In the spirit of Escher's drawing, the fish and the birds must smoothly merge together. The next picture shows a summary of where we are so far. The outer approximation, which holds for x a lot bigger than epsilon, is this one. That's a good approximation for almost all x, but is hopeless near x equals 0. It fails when x becomes round about the same size as epsilon. So for the outer solution to be a good approximation, we insist that x is a lot bigger than epsilon. On the other hand, the inner approximation, which is expressed in terms of the variable capital X, is given by this and that holds only for little x a lot less than 1. This one holds for x a lot bigger than epsilon. This one holds for x a lot less than 1. You will notice then that both are valid in a small overlap region because it's perfectly possible for x to be small and large at the same time in a particular sense. If we take x to be a lot less than 1 but a lot bigger than epsilon, as shown by this line, both these expressions hold. x a lot less than 1 means that x can be regarded as tending to 0. But recall that big X is little x over epsilon. So that if x is a lot bigger than epsilon, big X is large. So we can represent this by saying big X tend to infinity. 
The conclusion is then, for these two approximations to hold and to join together smoothly, the limit of the inner approximation, as big X tends to infinity, must smoothly match with the form of the outer approximation as little x tends to zero. So if I simultaneously let little x tend to zero and big X tend to infinity, these two representations for the solution must match smoothly together. Well, the limits are easy. If x tends to zero in this expression, y tends to e. On the other hand, if big X tends to infinity in this expression, then big Y tends to A. And for those two things to be equal, we require that A is equal to E, the exponential of 1, which is 2.718. So the outer approximation gave us something which was good except near the origin. The inner approximation gave us something which satisfied the condition at x equals 0, but still left us with a, an unknown constant. And the final matching requirement has determined what that constant A has to be. Now let's piece these together and see how it compares to the exact solution of the equation. In this picture, the solid line shows you the exact result. The dotted line shows you our outer approximation as before. And now the dotted broken line shows you the inner approximation. So for x small, that is smaller than epsilon, we follow the broken line. And for x a lot bigger than epsilon, we follow the dotted line. And the composite picture gives us a very good approximation everywhere. What happens if you take epsilon to be smaller and smaller and smaller? Well, in our picture, the outer approximation remains exactly the same. Little y0 was independent from epsilon. The inner approximation, our function capital Y0, simply shifts further and further over to the left. So if we took epsilon to be smaller and smaller and smaller, the broken dotted line would move further over to the left, and the exact solution would follow these two curves ever more closely. The point of this particular example is to show how, in two different regions, we need two quite different approximations to represent the exact solution adequately. In more complicated problems, we might need more solutions, three solutions. There is a famous triple-deck problem due to the uh, mathematician Keith Stewartson, which requires at least three approximations to adequately represent the solution of a problem in fluid mechanics. I'm now just going to finish by giving a very brief description of how this sort of analysis can be used to solve a physical problem, one of acoustics. I'm going to give almost no details, but simply indicate the, the sort of ideas that are used to solve such a problem. The problem is one of clarinet acoustics. The picture here shows a diagram of a clarinet. Solving the flow problem through such a complicated instrument is extremely difficult, so one makes a mathematical idealization, an applied mathematician would represent this complicated geometry by a much simpler one, in which the reed motion is represented by a piston, and here this shows a couple of holes, a couple of open holes of the clarinet. And this can be tackled by the method of matched expansions in the limit where the aperture radius, the size of the holes in the uh, side walls of the clarinet are much less than the tube radius and these are much less than the wavelength. The wavelength of the sound being, roughly speaking, comparable to the length of the instrument. How do we do that? Outside the clarinet, an observer is not really aware of the complete details of the geometry of the clarinet. An observer from the outside will hear sound just as if there were just sources of sound, sources of flow on the outside surface of the instrument. So viewed from the outside, one thinks you see a solid tube with stuff coming out of these two holes. And Q1 and Q2 are a measure of the amount of stuff, the amount of air flowing through the holes. That is a relatively simple problem that can be solved. Of course, we don't yet know what the magnitude of Q1 and Q2 are. Similarly, inside the clarinet, 
An observer is not too bothered about the details of the holes in this vicinity. An observer simply imagines stuff is disappearing at a point here and here. The Q1 and the Q2 are the same in both cases, but both unknowns. On the other hand, if you're situated near the hole, you're well aware of the exact geometry of the hole, but on such a small length scale, the fluid appears to you to be almost incompressible. So our inner view, if we magnify the picture and look at the vicinity of either one of these holes, we see something like this. In the local region near each aperture, the flow is almost that of an incompressible flow through a single aperture in an infinite plane. And the amount of stuff coming through, the measure of the volume of flow coming through that hole in time, uh, in unit time, is Q1. And this is a relatively simple problem. An incompressible flow through a single hole is much more simple than the original problem of many holes in a complicated clarinet geometry. So each of those three problems can be solved exactly. One has an outer problem involving two unknown source strengths, Q1 and Q2, an inner and interior solution involving Q1 and Q2, and the near field flow, the inner region, is virtually an incompressible flow sloshing about through a hole in an infinite wall. To determine Q1 and Q2, and hence solve the problem completely, one has to match those regions together. And I'll phrase it by this sentence. The local flow near, near each aperture has to match smoothly with the inside and outside solutions. And this matching leads to a determination of Q1 and Q2, and so the problem is solved throughout all space. I hope I've shown you some of the spirit of the method of matched asymptotic expansions. I've concentrated on very simple problems simply because one can compare the approximate solutions with known exact solutions. The whole power of the method is that it can be used for many difficult problems which can be solved by no other known method. And it's certainly the case that hundreds, probably thousands of problems in applied mathematics have been solved by such methods. It's a truly powerful method and one that's worth knowing about. Thank you very much.